Welcome, everybody, to the Gate Expectations podcast, where I bring in a weekly guest, talk all things Yu-Gi-Oh!, and get to know a little bit more about each person I talk to. This is the only Yu-Gi-Oh! podcast that is run by a full-fledged journalist such as myself. This is episode 11. If you haven't checked it out yet, you can check out earlier podcasts with guests like Stephen Trifonovsky, Jesse Cotton, Team Samurai X1, Doug Zeef, Cody Angeloff, and many more. My guest for this week has a YouTube channel with over 25,000 subscribers, spent the last 10 months filming his return to Yu-Gi-Oh!, and after a 10-year hiatus, he is back and one of the hottest Yugi tubers right now. It's Ryan O'Rourke, a.k.a. Ruggles. Man, Ryan, thank you so much for coming on to my podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I've wanted to do this for months now. I listen to all the episodes, and it's always a great listen. It was only a matter of time before I got you on, because not only are you right now like a big personality with this game, but we're also dear friends as well. We played against mm -hmm. each other before, and... You know, we I have visited your city, Belleville, where we've we've played and, and you know we've enjoyed ourselves when I was there, and we had great times dueling each other and just hanging out. So there's no reason for me not to bring you on, especially since we've been friends for God knows how long. <laughs> yeah, it's wild to think about just how long ago we did play at Action Pack Comics uh, shop in Belleville, which no longer unfortunately exists. But I remember when you would come down and everybody would be excited, be smiles. <laughs> and I just felt you like you uh, you brought such a good atmosphere to that shop. So, I mean, that, that, yeah. yeah, I mean, I always love coming to Belleville every time because it's about a, an hour, 15 minute drive away from where I am. And I made so many friends there. And I love playing with the community there because when I first came there, there were so many different players to play. When I and back in my hometown during that time, I would get about maybe 10, 12 people to play with. I go over to your meta. And holy crap, it was double the numbers. So I'm like, this was fantastic. This is like what I love playing. I don't care like the skill levels are bad. I don't care if the decks I'm playing are bad. I'm just happy to be around this many people and see such a strong community as your town was at the time. And I was, it was always a joy to go there. And I made so many friends. And there are many friends I've made that are past Yu-Gi-Oh!, but I still have like long-lasting friends with them. And you're one of them, however. That's kind of changed all of a sudden now that you're back. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, again, just thinking back to that, we used to have between 20 to 35 people in that shop every weekend. That was, I guess, between GOAT format and Teledad format. And it was just, it was wild. It was so much fun to literally go and see like 30 of your friends every it, week. Exactly. Yeah. To get that excuse. Yeah, which was fantastic. I looked forward to every single visit. I believe we met around 2008 because that was around a Gladiator Beast format. And that was the first time that we actually met and we actually played each other. I know we played each other in the semifinals uh, of that <laughs> tournament. And I went there with yeah. uh, uh, Tyson Spicer was the one who brought me there to Belva and, and told me and he was trying to like hype me up or something about my, my forthcoming to that shop. And he told me, oh, yeah, you got you got a good chance of uh, winning the whole thing. And uh, it, I had a wonderful experience being there in Belleville. It made me want to come back. And I went back and back again. I didn't even lived there for uh, about two years because I, I went to school there as well. So great city to be around in Belleville. A wonderful, huge bridge that they have. Uh, where I used to go fishing there with my father all the time when I was younger. And, uh, you know, I made a lot of long lasting friendships. Definitely love that place. And uh, uh, there's no way in hell I was not going to have you on this show. Oh, again, thank you so much. I mean, it's, it's been wild coming back, getting to see you again. Like, even at regionals, at the Toronto regionals, so much fun. Thank you for uh, the B-roll that you uh, helped me get there <laughs> yeah. for the vlog. Uh, being a, a Yu-Gi-Oh! vlogger, going to an event and then not actually being able to film the games at an event can be a little bit difficult, but you definitely kind of saved the day there at the end, gave me some nice clean orchest, by the way. Yeah. You know, yep. good for you always playing those good decks. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, because uh, I know like you're into video production at the time, and uh, I, I'm a journalist, and I had to learn to do all those things. So for people who don't know what B-roll is, B-roll is all those like little like random clips that you would see that kind of like add color to a story. So for example, in, if you watch any of Ruggles' video, it's me like maybe shuffling a deck, making a play. It's just those little clips that you would see like maybe during like a voiceover or something like that. And I know that uh, you were struggling to get a whole bunch of it because, you know, we, you weren't really allowed to film a whole lot, especially dueling when the event was going on. So I remember <laughs> I came to you and talked to you and like, do you want me to sit you down and do a bunch of real B-roll? Cause I'm, 
playing a meta deck right now. Well, meta at the time, and I thought it would just be great for you to take a whole bunch of shots. And like, I know the process. I know what it is to get B roll and and how valuable it is. You can never have enough. So I thought right. I would just tell you, like, hey, sit down. I'll get I'll get you some B roll, man, and you can add some clips to your to your video. And sure enough, they they popped on there. So I'm glad I was able to be a big help for you there. Yeah, so much fun though. Really, <laughs> so, yeah. So let's let's rewind all the way back to the get the beginning. What first of all, how did you get into the game of Yu-Gi-Oh? I think like a lot of people in the early 2000s, I watched the show when I was in I don't know, maybe grade 4 with all of my friends. We saw that there was cards, hunted them down and um, you know, started to play, didn't know the rules, just kind of had fun with it. Said, "Oh, that one has a 3000 attack, yours has 2500. I win the game." You know, very, <laughs> very basic. And I think it kind of needs to be that way when you're, you know, as young as we were. But yeah, I think we started there and then we went to the shop in Trenton for a couple of years where the rules were still a little iffy. Yes. Um, and then Ryan Kane, who you are very familiar with, Love told me man. about uh, uh, the shop in Belleville. And then, you know, we actually started playing a bit more competitively at the end of GOAT format. But yeah, like like a lot of people, it was the show. Yeah, and for those who don't know, uh, Belleville is about a ninety minutes east of Toronto, so we're not too far off. So making those kind of regionals are pretty easy for all of us to attend. By the way, and I love Ryan Kane. He's a he's a great guy. Um, since my last name is Bowie, he always nicknamed me Boo Boo Bear, like uh, from Yogi Bear. So we, <laughs> so we always had we always had this little thing where I'd tell him, "Little man, we're gonna go swipe a bunch of picnic baskets today." And we'd always make that joke. That's I adorable. Love, I love Ryan. He's a great guy to hang around, and I've, I've partied with him, hung out with him a bunch, played cards with him. Great man to be with, and we've traveled to several regionals together, including Ottawa. And we had to play each other one round, which sucked. I didn't want to play him. <laughs> I hate playing local friends. Oh, at I know. Regionals. Uh, the only at time the... I don't mind it if it's like the stakes are high, mm -hmm. then I don't yeah. mind it. At, at the last at Toronto the... Regionals, yep. uh, Ryan and I, we ended up playing each other in the first match. It was, uh, I think we had 300 people at the Regionals, but we played each other round number one. You'll never guess what deck he was playing. Think back to the last Toronto Regionals. <laughs> Give me a guess. If I had to guess him, my guess is he was probably playing Dangerous Thunder. Mystic Mine Burn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. He yeah. didn't tell me about the, him wanting to play with a control deck because he doesn't really care uh, when no. he goes into these regions. Although he's actually topped one Toronto regional before, like top mm -hmm. eight, which is funny but with given the amount of care he actually puts into the game, which, which is not a lot. He just likes to play for fun and just kind of joke around. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Great guy, though, nonetheless. And, uh, and, and then you left Yu-Gi-Oh for a while. So what made you leave? I, well, I played up until the end of high school for the most part. And then mm -hmm. when it came time to go off to university, I went to OCAD U in Toronto, majored in fine art and then minored in film. Two things you'd think you'd never get a job in, but you know, <laughs> then you became a thing and both of which uh, were fantastic. Um <laughs> But yeah, so I went to university and I just said, you know what, I need to focus on this. I want to focus on friends, um, you know, enjoy, enjoy kind of growing up like that. Yes. And then I got out of that and I said, OK, you know, we're going to build a business and that's going to be the focus. And then once I'm done that, I can have some fun again. And that's really just been the, the journey and the call. And I felt like I was finally at a place where uh, I was making good money, business was very healthy, and I could have fun on my Saturdays, reconnect with friends. Yeah, well, you have a very successful alternate YouTube channel as well called uh, Stay Creative Painting with Brian O'Rourke. And over there, you even have more subscribers on that one than you do on your Ruggles channel, over 238 <laughs> subscribers. Tell me more about that channel. Oh, uh, well, that was born because while I was in university, I came across a couple of different painters online. Uh, Lisa from Lockery Fine Art, Martin Whitfuth uploaded a, a couple of videos and they just uploaded themselves painting. I thought that was really interesting to see their process, to see them as artists create. And I thought, you know what? I, I'm minoring in film. I might as well make some videos. It's kind of a good cross between my major and my minor. And I started uploading them. People asked for different types of lessons. So I started catering to that. 
started a couple of series, got consistent. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, that's a, that's a living. Okay, great. And then I just kind of continued to pursue it from there. How were you able to build such like a large following and, and demographic considering you have so many subscribers on that channel? I think that whenever you're building really anything online, consistency is really the greatest asset. And I know that might sound kind of funny to anybody who watches my Yu-Gi-Oh! channel, but it's not really something I've taken all that seriously. I put a lot of love and care into it, but I didn't choose to approach it like I would a business because I wanted it to remain quite fun. But I think if you are going in to create content really on any level online, setting out to upload something at least once a week is really big. That is uh, something I dedicated myself to over the years of the painting channel. And because of that, we were able to get to almost now 250,000. I think we're going to do it in the next month and a half. <laughs> and every time I look at all the thumbnails of those videos, I feel like you're uh, a younger like buffer like uh, Bob Ross without the, without the afro. I mean, you have, like, the, you have the angle there and you can see your massive right bicep in there. And we all know from watching your videos that you also work out as well. So when I said that you were the uh, the hottest Yugi tubers right now, I meant that ambiguously. I meant that both in terms of looks and in terms of uh, trending. Wink, wink, I appreciate wink, that. <laughs> I do. Yeah, that's fun. A couple of us have talked about doing a, a little Yu-Gi-Oh calendar, something kind of funny. Yeah. So, you know. Maybe one day. Yeah. Well, the thing is, you told me that you, you studied film. And when I watch all your videos, I, I said to myself, one of the first first time I watched your video, I'm like, this is some of the best video production I've seen go into a Yu-Gi-Oh! video out of all the Yu-Gi-Oh! tubers I've ever seen before. And I have to, I have to wonder, that's got to be part of your film background for you to make these kind of videos. Because I see that... You know, you don't, uh, there's not a lot of time in between, sorry, there's a lot of time in between each video you make, but as you said, there's a lot of time and a lot of love that go into each of these videos, and I see all the work, and I've done video editing myself when I was in journalism school, yeah, it takes a lot of work, and seeing all this kind of production that you make, it's, it's stunning, it's beautiful, it's well narrated, it's well voiced. Like everything is so pristine and so calculated when I see these videos. So I, I think that plays like a really vital role for you uh, when you built your popularity on this channel. Yeah, I well, when I got back into Yu-Gi-Oh, I saw all of these really fantastic different channels talking about deck building, talking about the metagame, talking about, you know, what packs you should invest in, all of those great things. But something I felt like there really wasn't much of was high production vlogging and that's something that had been you know at the forefront of youtube for years at this point so i thought you know what i've wanted to start a vlog for quite some time i think that Yu-Gi-Oh could be a great conduit to it in that there is some level of travel there's a lot of different things that you can aesthetically work into there there's definitely a series of mini goals and stories and it just seemed to fit that format quite well so i was able to take that background in film and kind of integrate that into Yu-Gi-Oh! in a really fun way. And I, I think a big inspiration of that was definitely Gage Nim Nim. I mean, the guy does fantastic vlogs with Sealed Only. I think that that's actually where I initially had the idea to do something vlog-oriented like him. And then I just thought, you know what, I'd, I'd put my own spin on it and um, really invest time into the production. Yeah, you build your brand similar how I'm attempting to build my brand right now. Like, I went to... I went to school for journalism. I have a double major mm -hmm. in journalism philosophy, and I'm trying to implement those skills now into this podcast where interviewing is one of the many tasks that I'm supposed to perform as a journalist. So I thought, you know, let's transfer those real life skills that I've developed into something productive towards Yu-Gi-Oh! And then you've done the same thing as well, just at a much more visual level. Like my video editing isn't uh, the best so I figured, what's the best way to exploit my talents and, you know, hide my weaknesses? And I thought, you know, a podcast would do it. But you, again, you're exploiting all of your strengths in your video production. And again, like they're, they're completely beautiful. And, you know, they're very lengthy as well. A majority of them are well over 15 minutes, some of them reaching a half an hour. So they're a really good long watch if you just want to just binge your channel. Well, I think what you're saying is a great example of how to succeed really in almost anything, especially online, taking pre-existing talents that you have and figuring out how to interject them into something else that you may be interested in, because then you're taking a strength into something. You're not trying to copy what's already been done. You're not saying that's what that 
uh, you YouTuber, that content creator does all do exactly that. Know you are integrating yourself and upgrading that quality of content with, again, yes. what you bring to the table. And in your case, uh, the ability to talk to people, the ability to have great conversations, to segue awkward pauses and, you know, all of those different things that I'm sure you picked up with your degree in journalism. You notice how I took a moment of silence there? A journalism tip. We don't go like, er, or uh, we give a silence. And people may not notice that. That's <laughs> a little tip go. I learned. That's a little tip. I like but it. yeah, that, that's, that's exactly it, though. It's, it's applying those wonderful skills, you know, and some people have, like, wonderful personalities, like, really ecstatic personalities, kind of like Triff and Team Samurai X and mm -hmm. Sam. They got wonderful personalities. I've met them both in real life, talked to them in real life, legitimately how they are. That's that's the oh, that way. Yeah. 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 And, I, and I'm sure you can testify that too, because you've done a lot of collaborations as well with several other uh, Yugi tubers as well. As you said, Naheem is, is one of them for sure. And I'm reading on your YouTube channel that his sealed only challenge and Rev Z cards, you know, Yugi from scratch was uh, a big part of your inspiration in returning to the game. Could you tell me uh, how that came about? Yeah, I, again, I was just looking at different content online, you know, kind of remembering the good old days, having that nostalgia. And when I came across Nim Nim and then in turn Rev's Cards, I saw that you could integrate vlogging and more video production into Yu-Gi-Oh! That there are ways of kind of expanding upon the genre. And it just kind of got those gears turning in my head saying, OK, well, you know, I, I could film that and I could you know, um, also incorporate maybe some eating or travel or you know, all of these different things that I've always wanted to film because I love capturing time. I love capturing moments, having these things to look back on for years. I think there's a reason there's such a heavy focus on nostalgia in the vlogs. And that's, you know, just that I feel like life's good and I want to capture as much of it as I can. And I saw the Yu-Gi-Oh! vlog as an opportunity to capture that time with friends, capture those, you know, improvements, but also all of these other aspects of life as well. Um, I mean, I think in by episode three, I, I was filming the fact that I was watching Smallville with my girlfriend on Halloween, <laughs> and just different little things like that, that I also think make channels like uh, all the YouTubing ones a bit more personable. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's also something that there wasn't too much of when I got into Yugi tubing. The mm -hmm. fact that these are actually people that they have lives. It wasn't, um, you know, fully explored in that way. And I definitely saw something special there with what Gage is doing. And I wanted to kind of further that idea. You know, it's amazing how we can draw so many parallels from what you and I are doing with our mm -hmm. own respective channels, because I love talking to people and hearing about their stories. It's one of the many reasons why I got into journalism, because I want to kind of share those stories. I want to have a conversation with people. I don't like shutting people out. I like to hear what they have to say. It doesn't matter if I agree with them or not. Being mm -hmm. able to hear somebody's stories and different experiences, it only makes them you know, it makes yourself get smarter and more intelligent by doing so. So that's, that's one route of journalism that I do. And that's also something I do with the podcast is that you get, I want to know people on more personal levels, even though I already know you on a personal level always, but not everyone who's a fan of you, a subscriber to you knows you that well on a personal level. So I kind of want to use this podcast to really find out who are the real people here behind this podcast. And th this is what like your vlog is. It's basically uh, a take a dip into your life in and outside of you, Gil. Like you've shown us about your art, you've shown us about your work at Benjamin, uh, your your girlfriend, and just your daily life with hanging out with your friends in Belva, which most of them are also my friends as well. So mm -hmm. it's a really a great way to examine and analyze your life, almost like a like a TV show, almost just to really get to know deep down that you know all of us are human as well, and we have lives outside of you, Gil. It's a it's a intriguing side of a person to see. Yeah. And I, you know, I think back to your podcast and the fact that you don't always just talk about Yu-Gi-Oh. I mean, I think one of my favorite parts uh, in your conversation with Jesse Cotton was when you two were talking about traveling and eating and specifically how uh, some of them wanted to go exploring in a different country and some of them didn't taking some different wrong turns and just hearing about all of that. It adds so much more context to the game, to these events. And it just... It's really interesting. I love hearing about the personal side to the game and the players. Yeah, because I wanted to bring something different to every single 
episode that I do because I don't want just the same episode about getting someone's opinion on the current meta or their deck or whatnot. You know, I want to mm-hmm. hear their side. This is a profile about the other person. I want to know more about you, Ruggles. I don't know. want to know about just about your opinion on the meta. Of course, we can talk about that if we want to, but I want to know the real you. I want to explore avenues that no one else has decided to go into, which is one of the other reasons why I wanted to do this podcast, because I have so many friends in this game, but I know mm-hmm. that I have many friends that I don't know so much outside of the game. And I know that I've had some friendship diminished because they've quit the game, uh, but there are a lot of friendships I've retained even while they quit the game. So I, it's yeah. it's just a part of human life that you really want to know somebody like outside of it. And I thought this was a great outlet for it. Yeah. So, and again, I never knew that about Jesse either, that like he was so interested in, you know, in history and, and sightseeing. I mean, I thought that was a bit of an eye opener and, and I thought it was pretty intriguing as well. So maybe we can dissect and uh, know a little bit more about you as we go deeper into this <laughs> podcast. Sounds good. Sounds really good. <laughs> so you decided to vlog your entire return uh, to Yu-Gi-Oh! And it took you about 10 months and holy heck, it took you 19 weeks worth <laughs> of filming to get it all done but you don't have anything else aside from just vlogging so why did you decide to vlog your whole entire return again so much of it was just wanting to capture those moments so 10 years down the road i can look back at the shop i can look back at myself my interactions with my friends i can remember the game and these times in a very real tangible way I always loved taking pictures and it just seemed like the next step forward to continuing to do that while also practicing my ability to film and you know create quality video content while also also <laughs> just actually learning the game so it was kind of a win 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 scenario yeah and during that way you've built such an incredible following in such a short amount of time i mean getting over 25,000 subscribers <laughs> in a span of less than 1 year is absolutely impressive you know how can you attribute uh, the success that you've had with your videos up until now okay i love saying this and he'll deny it every time i please, do but please please a a big part of it i believe was farfa someone sent me or rather someone sent him one of my videos while he was on his stream and he decided to watch it and he you know showed the probably 700 people concurrently who are watching the channel then he tweeted about it he left a really nice comment he shared it and he i think really got the algorithm going because after he did that the video started to get a little more traction than simo dz if they saw it they shared it and I think a really big part of the channel's growth wasn't necessarily my talent, to be honest, but more so the community just being incredibly friendly and embracing it, sharing it, helping me get it out there from the beginning. Because when you have, you know, the <laughs> really the largest content creators for Yu-Gi-Oh! on Twitch and YouTube, uh, they've got your back, they're sharing your content, it's, uh, it's kind of hard to fail. So I, I really attribute that initial growth very much too far for and some luck as well i think um you know success happens when opportunity and luck meet um and you know we we put in that hard work and it just it all worked out so yeah just having good content and then getting lucky with great people finding it i find that that's a really big deal and a major factor nowadays for anybody who wants to starting out small and trying to grow themselves it's endorsements from like all the other bigger players as well Mm -hmm. that they they're endorsing like a big quality product because you know there's so many people that try to do a youtube channel that try to do their own little page try to do something and there's so many that you know fail or just don't do quite as well and it's really hard to you know find a diamond in the rough per se and you know luckily for you somebody you know thought that you were really well got you to farfa he enjoyed your content and then all of a sudden now boom you're getting all these endorsements from everyone else. And now, you know, again, 24, 25,000 subscribers later, look at you. You're a big powerhouse now. You've rubbed elbows with a whole lot of uh, Yugi tubers. I've seen you with a picture with uh, Team Samurai X1. That was a big oh, picture yeah. after, uh, after regionals. And I know you guys endorsed each other, I think, on, I believe, on Instagram as well. So I know that's a really big deal as well. So, um, so for you now who's starting to grow, how do you find yourself uh, endorsing? 
uh, you know, the, the smaller guys who want to try to get big, because I know you're endorsing one of it. Who's also a good friend of ours, uh, uh, Mario Feliz, who has his own gaming shop and channel Mario's gaming world as an example. Yeah, I think that's a, a great question and something we should always really be considering. I definitely find different uh, creators that I like and I share them amongst my friend group. Oh, you know, uh, one person actually, Milano, you've probably seen his videos. I'm sure yeah. everybody has seen his videos. Great yeah. guy from Toronto. Really just so, so sweet. Um, he started and, you know, whenever he posts anything, we uh, try to share that about, get it to everybody. Always, you know, like, share, comment, do all of that, get it going in the algorithm. And I think that's really the easiest way anybody at home can help a creator they really enjoy, you know, leave comments, leave likes, ensure that all of those little interactions are happening on those videos so that they do get picked up, that they do get more in that related tab. It gets out to more people because I know uh, whenever I would upload, <laughs> I, I get so many people noting that, you know, it was at the top of my related tab and that's how I found you. It's at the top of my related tab and that's how I found you. Um, and I have one friend who notes that he showed him one video and now every time I upload, despite the fact that he doesn't watch any other Yu-Gi-Oh videos, that I end up right there. And it's just because of that um, people going out of the way to help with those interactions. And that's definitely an easy way of going about it. I'm also putting together a couple of uh, collab videos that I don't want to talk too much about because it's kind of in the next wave of what the channel is going to be. But you'll see some smaller creators, some larger creators coming together doing some pretty cool things. Did you ever imagine yourself uh, becoming as successful as you are now with your videos? Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. <laughs> I've, I think I've always been a confident person. I think that if I really put my mind to something, I can find real success with it. And that's kind of just how it's always been. So when I got into this, I expected at some point to have a rather large channel um, because like I've also been on YouTube for like a decade now. Uh, I built a couple of channels, found real success with them. And I, you kind of, you learn how to do it. You learn the different tricks. You learn what's important, how to kind of maneuver around the platform. Mm -hmm. And so I expected at some point it would occur, to be honest, but it all happened so much more quickly than I expected, again, because of great people like Sam, Farfa, DZ, CMO, all of them just really making it take off. Mm -hmm. And we, we know that you've already done a couple collaborations already online. Like, I know you're part of uh, one of CMO's, like, YouTuber ch championships. And uh, you also, this, and also, this isn't the first podcast that you've done either as well. So I know you've done a lot of collaborations. How does it feel to be able to interact with uh, so many other YouTubers and being able to produce videos together with them? Oh, it's, it's so cool. Honestly, I thought that it would be <laughs> less exciting maybe less dramatic than it is initially because in the art world in the you know art space on youtube i do talk to other creators who have you know 200 300 000 subscribers mm -hmm. um and it's you know regular conversations because we're in the same business mm -hmm. but for whatever reason with Yu-Gi-Oh, having the opportunity to talk to these guys for the first time it's always um you know, just special. It's special. Uh, uh, I, I can tell like right now I'm getting a little tongue twisted just thinking about all the different really amazing interactions. I've told the story a couple of times on the vlog, but at my first Toronto regionals, uh, someone taps on my shoulder. Uh, they say, hey, man, I expect it to be a, a subscriber because that had happened a couple of times through the day. And then it's Sam. <laughs> it's like, oh, <laughs> wow. Nice. Hey, uh, yeah, really, really cool. Just the fact that like, he was a, he was very busy. Sam is always very busy. He's talking to people. Yes. He's signing, yes. but like taking the time to be like, "Hey, I, uh, I saw your channel. If you ever need anything, let me know." Um, just going out of his way to be a great guy really took me back. And I've had that experience with a couple of different creators. Always, always really cool. It's those human interest stories that really kind of touch the heart and really like just just clasp at it because you know again as i said before like we're all humans and you know we, we all make mistakes here and there but at the end of the day we're just 
we're just ordinary people, you know, that just doing a thing we love. So, you know, just having that kind of surreal moment that you can have like a heartfelt moment with a, another person who, you know, has kind of done the same struggle as you have and, and, you know, fought their way to get to the top. You know, it's kind of nice that they would, you know, come back down to earth and, you know, give you that endearing moment and say, Hey, let's, uh, I'd love to help you out. I think you do a really good job. You know, it must be a great feeling for you when you were told that from Sam. Oh yeah. 100% because when I, again, when I was just looking at the game in general, I, I think Sam actually was the one who convinced me to pick up the, the hero deck, which admittedly wasn't the most competitive deck, uh, especially in Orcus Striker format, but it was so much fun. You could do so much in a turn, especially, you know, going back to previously, what was the like greatest amount of summons you do in Teledad format, like seven, eight, nine. Um, so to, you know, have... 30 different interactions on your turn with the deck. It was so much fun. So I kind of feel like he, you know, he got me started. He got me thinking about actually playing the modern game. And so to have him come up and say that was uh, pretty wild. Yeah. And that's what a number of your videos really focuses on. It's uh, it focuses on the heroes. Like, oh, <laughs> I see a lot of them are cycling around that. So would, would you say that that was pretty much the moment where you decided to, to focus on heroes and kind of building it to be competitive? Because I knew that in the December regionals, that's what you're, or the one of those Toronto regionals, at least anyway, that's the deck that you were playing. Yeah, yeah. So I decided to go with heroes initially because it didn't seem like necessarily the best deck but it seemed like a lot of fun it seemed like a really good entry point into Yu-Gi-Oh! it linked summon but not too much it had a lot of fusion summoning it was familiar but advanced and that's really what I wanted it was also quite non-linear which also made it really interesting getting into the game it wasn't memorized just one combo and then just kind of go it was always continuously engaging so I started with that, and I had a lot of fun with it. And then I came across Jesse Cotton and the uh, Thunder Combo deck. I gave that a try. It was a lot of fun. And I just, I don't know. I, I guess maybe it was nostalgia in it. But Heroes just seemed like the deck I really wanted to continue working with, continue um, building almost a, a character with in the mm -hmm. vlog right every week it was updated we made a little change we made a tweak we figured out how to make it adapt to the format at hand and we definitely got significantly better with the deck since then i've uh, played a lot of synchro eldritch a lot of dragon link a lot of inferno noble knights and decks that are you know more so competitive within the current format but i think when you're just getting into the game finding something that you have a lot of fun with and something that can continuously challenge you and allow you to learn is a really, really good thing. And that was the right deck for me to do that. I also think a lot of people just enjoyed it. I mean, you can watch so many videos, so many videos <laughs> on YouTube of the most competitive decks going at it at that time. But to have something that's a bit more niche, a bit more rogue, I think that had definitely added to the interest in the videos. And I wanted to really just see, as someone who didn't know what they were doing in modern Yu-Gi-Oh!, <laughs> how far we could take it i think we bubbled with it at two different regionals which is pretty cool mm -hmm. um so yeah i was i was quite happy well that was one thing that i was happy to see you go with heroes because it's non-linear but it's also very combo based yet also controlled based because if you're trying mm -hmm. to get yourself back into the game that's the kind of deck you need to do to be able to help yourself adapt to the new game because again as you mentioned before just memorizing one combo for one deck isn't going to really develop your skill that much per se. So uh, being able to play that kind of deck has really helped. And uh, I know that back when, you know, I first came to Belleville, Tyson warned me of you and told me that <laughs> you were the best player in Belleville at the time. So hey, I was expecting a big fight against you uh, if and when we got paired together. And sure enough, we were. So, you know, and, and I'm sure that skill eventually you can retain some of that going into the hero deck and then eventually when you're done with heroes and you want to go into another deck you can retain a lot of that skill that you learned from heroes and hopefully you know start becoming uh like at least a, a big relevant player because like I, I know that you haven't really done a whole lot in terms of the competitive game but it, this is like a, tr a your track to get back onto that and be able to possibly like go places in the competitive scene as like as further as you've never gone before 
I guess to um, <laughs> kind of jump back to the Tyson comment for a second there. Yeah, go ahead. When we were at Action Packed, I there was a year. There was a year. I, I was doing really well consistently at that low course. Again, it was like 20 to 30 people. It wasn't like the most competitive low course, but it was enough people to feel accomplished at the end of the day, if you know what I mean. Agreed. And, and I was like, I don't know, anywhere between 11 to 15, I guess, in that kind of time span. And I really wanted to win a full year in a row of low course. I wanted to win 52 weeks. And I uh, I think I got to 26 weeks, 26 <laughs> victories in a row. And then it was Thanksgiving and I couldn't go to locals. So I, I didn't get that one. And then I think, I think you were my only other loss in that year, but otherwise I would have won 52. Uh, oh. 52 weeks. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was pretty fun. I, I definitely used to be a much better player than I am now, just because as a kid, you don't have that much to think about. You're not always doing your bookkeeping, your taxes. You're not running multiple businesses. You're not doing the hundreds of things that you kind of have to do when you grow up. And um, yeah, I I definitely think I was a much better player then. Um, but that's also because I knew the cards, I knew the decks, and I had the time to kind of dedicate to it in a way I haven't had since getting back to the game. I actually did not know that I broke your streak now. I don't know if I feel proud or if I feel <laughs> unhappy that I did that. Oh, no, actually, it was it was great because you did. I, I, think, it, I think it was the first time we played. Um, and then I also lost you the second time we played. And because the rest of the locals was, wasn't, um, I, I wouldn't say easy, but like achievable in those wins, whenever you came down, I was like, oh, yeah, okay, we've got we've got something to have fun with here. And then I remember the first time I did beat you in the Gladiator Beast format, I it, it just felt so big because you did take away that year-long streak that I was going to build up. <laughs> and it, it just felt great. So, you know, again, I'm, um, I'm very much someone who likes the journey. I, I like the adventure of whatever I'm doing. And, you know, you don't have much of a journey or an adventure if you just win all the time. You need those losses so that you can have those comebacks and those just really exciting moments. It definitely helps keep you in check and it doesn't get you overly confident or cocky because definitely in those formats, majority of the time, it was the better player won. There wasn't a whole lot of luck involved with those formats. Mm -hmm. So being able to grind out that win definitely is big. I have a small anecdote myself. I won't name the player, but that player <laughs> is a big name back in the day and I could never beat him. But when the stakes were the highest, we were in the last round of regionals, and it was we were both on the bubble. It was winner would make it in, loser goes home. I had never topped a Toronto regional in my life, and I actually 2 owed him and <laughs> topped and topped the first regional uh, in Toronto that I ever had. And that was the first time that Toronto moved from eight rounds to nine rounds due to attendance. So after I won my eighth round, I'm like, I'm going to top. Oh, wait, no, there's another round. Shoot. <laughs> and then I saw who I was playing. I'm like, oh, my God, this person is one of the oh, best God. in the business. And I'm like, I have to go against him. I have a losing record against this person. Oh, oh God. But I it felt so spots. satisfying when I got that win. So, yeah. So, I, but to a much smaller scale, I bet that's kind of how it felt when you finally, like, bested me. Yeah. Yeah, time. 100%. 100%. Yeah. It was a big because, moment. Here. Yeah, because that's kind of – um it's kind of a monument to like all the work and research that you put into, to be able to like, and that drive to get yourself like back in the competitive spirit, knowing that, okay, I can be beaten. I want to get better. And then when you actually beat that person who beat you before, it's like, it, it's satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like back then I, I was really lucky. I got to play with all the big boys. I think like you, Tom and everybody else, Ryan, like you guys were probably 20, I don't know. I, I was like 14 though. So like being able to uh, play with the big boys and actually, uh, you know, finally take that win was uh, really yeah. exciting. Also when you're 14, everything's just like absolutely wild. You don't know anything. Yeah. Yet. <laughs> just, yeah. And, it's all exciting. I've, and I've been in your shoes. Exactly. Cause I started the game when I was 15 uh, when I was like, well, like, and then like 15, 16, I had these several guys who came, who came from a different town that was just not too far off Campbellford for mm -hmm. the Ontario locals who know that place. Uh, and they would come over and they were easily like seven, eight years older than me. And then they, and they beat me perennially. And then I finally got to best both of them in, in the playoff rounds and I won the tournament. And it was such a gratifying feeling just being able to beat them. It was so felt so rewarding. And I'm again, you know, being able to overcome that mountain again, like when you beat me, it was that same. I'm sure it was that same feeling, just as I beat that unnamed professional duelist that I had at regionals. 
Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, you know, to kind of harken back to a conversation we were having previously in the podcast, why choose vlogging? Why choose kind of recording the whole journey? Because we have these stories that we are talking about, that we are excited about. You know, you tell me these things, I get goosebumps, and I'm sure you get them just kind of reliving them mentally to be able to capture these and actually look back on them. That's huge. And that's something I'm so excited for, especially, especially when, you know, everything that's kind of going on in the world comes to an end, regionals do return, and we can get back to those really big triumphant fun moments yeah and you know with all the the political discourse that's happening right now and the epidemic that we're under you know we we reach a lot to something positive we want to take mm -hmm. something away from like, something away from our, our minds to take away from all this and this is kind of one of those outlets is being able to relive this this nostalgia days and you know the, the good times and we know that you know the rough times aren't going to last forever and, and it does get tough for a lot of us but being able to live back on these fun memories is definitely something to kind of hold on to and just give yourself like a nice temporary escape from reality it's like watching sports or something or like maybe watching somebody like play stream video games like that it's just a way to escape life for a little bit and just kind of enjoy yourself and i think that's what uh you and i are kind of doing right now with uh these videos on these podcasts it's being able to relive and retell the stories that we've had maybe you know when we come back and watch these like five ten years down the road exactly yeah and i do think escapism especially now is incredibly valuable i mean when everything did get locked down and you know we just couldn't see people for months here in Belleville we started a discord server and we played online we had our own little locals every Saturday and <laughs> having that excuse and that opportunity to still talk to just so many of the friends every single week it was huge mental health wise I feel like it really kept us together it ensured that we were you know staying with the game and I really really credit that in these times to, you know, I think all of us feeling a lot better than we would have otherwise. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that one because it was really hard times when we had to go into a quarantine and, you know, it was very unfamiliar territory for, for almost everybody. So mm -hmm. be, being able to, to grasp onto something that we needed to, you know, to bring some positivity to our lives is definitely a big deal. And it's, and it, and when I watch your videos too, like I know, all the people that, that are in your videos and it's, it's nice to see them kind of grow and, you know, just kind of live their lives. Like when, when I'm not around watching them too. And then, and that's a great outlet for me because, you know, I used to live in Belleville. I know all these people, they're all my friends too. And I just love kind of seeing that, that side of them as well, which is a big reason why I love watching your videos along with the, the video production quality. And of course that it's you and we're really good friends as well. <laughs> so that's I a feel, big thing. Yeah. Exact same way with you on the podcast. <laughs> Wonderful. So let's let's dive more into um, Belleville locals because you know every person has their own locals that th they grew up with that they made friends with. They kind of built on you know their lore or you know the skills that they have. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I've and I've seen the evolution of Belleville when it comes to shops. We've seen them go through different like several different shops. We've seen them go through through action pack games, and then we had good sell comics. We've had. Uh, P Market, we've had Skylywags, and now it's finally evolved, and now it's to Mario's Gaming World, where we both of us know Mario Phillies. We know he, ha he has his own YouTube channel. He's a pretty cool guy to be around. I enjoy like playing him. He gives me a great duels as well. Mm -hmm. So, w what made you decide that you wanted to show, uh, you know, that side of you, like your own locals? Because uh, I, I'm gonna truth be told, I don't think anybody around here knows anybody else from Belleville aside from you. <laughs> so, so why, so like, uh, not, not to be off offensive or anything on that part, but you know, why, why, why did you decide to showcase, you know, all your friends in your own local, uh, in the manner that you did? I think a lot of that was honestly for me personally, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. these are people that I'm getting to know. These are people that I know at some point are probably going to be good friends. And I think back to playing with guys like Mario or Jonathan Lynch, you know, 11 years ago, and I wanted more pictures. I wanted more time with them. I, I wanted to be able to capture that. And I think that getting all of those very personal moments, while they might not immediately connect with everybody who's watching the vlog and video, I know they'll connect with me. I know they'll mean a lot to me, and that's a clip that will be important down the line. I also mm -hmm. think that over time, 
the audience can build a connection with different people. And there's a kind of an ongoing joke in the comment section of the vlog that <laughs> uh, Gannon and I are kind of the protagonist and the antagonist of the series. I'm not going to know <laughs> that either of us is one or the other. But I think uh, different people have their favorites. But, you know, frequently we find ourselves in that top two scenario. Sometimes he takes it, sometimes I take it. And yes. I just think that having those characters just also makes a lot of fun for everybody else. I know that uh, while I'm not the biggest wrestling fan, you are. And I'm sure in terms of wrestling, there's all of this lore built up around these different people, all of these different uh, past interactions. And I, I'd assume that it would make it significantly more interesting. And that was very much my idea and my intent with incorporating other people into the vlog. Well, two two things I want to add to that. Number one, it kind of feels like kind of like a reality show of just your life and kind of showcasing all your friends. You know, everyone starts to kind of kind of like almost like develop like a character on on your series. I mean, I, lo I love Gannon. He's a great guy to be around. Great duelist as well. I know he's topped a couple regionals, and I love hanging around with him. And he's starting to come into his own now. But he's always had like a great personality uh, on the camera. And then mm -hmm. second of all, you know, odds are we're not going to be playing Yu Gi Oh forever. So right. it's and but but the, it's definitely safe to say that we'll retain a lot of friendships uh, after this game. I mean, my best friend no longer plays Yu-Gi-Oh! and he's been my partner in crime for for so many years now. But, you know, we've developed a very close relationship. We're great friends. Uh, we, you know, we travel to Los Angeles almost every year together. And if and when I get married, he's going to be my best man as well. So oh. I think it's also I think it's also like a great way to kind of capture those memories of friends once you like go past Yu-Gi-Oh because like, again we don't expect everybody here to remain the game from now until like the day they die no no I, I completely agree and it's about building those connections that can last for longer than the game can right yeah I, I just feel a little saddened though that uh, I don't get to be directly part of your video series <laughs> because I moved out of Belleville uh, by the time you decided to c come back and uh, start doing your series because I moved out of there about last year in last year in May is when I moved out. And then you, you came in a, oh, a couple months later too, but I, I still feel like Belleville is like as, as, as strong as ever now, especially with Mario's new shop. And then now that you've brought it kind of, you kind of like put it on the map a little bit with your series <laughs> because you talk about all your friends on it. And, and uh, my, our friend M Mike Tremere would also post all your videos on like our little personal discord chat. And I'm like, Oh, like R Ryan, um, Ryan put a video series out, looked at him like, Oh wow. Like these videos are actually really good. And Holy geez, he's got a lot of subscribers. He's really popular out there. Good for Ryan. I was so happy to find out how popular you were when I started clicking on your videos. I'm like, Oh man, like Ryan has really made a name for himself. I'm proud of this man. And uh, you know, again, like we're, we're good. We're good friends and we've been friends for a while. And it's, it's great to see that your peers like really grow into their own and really develop something really cool to, to share with the world. And, you know, that's why, uh, that's why I respect your product. And man, I just, I love watching your vids, man. Well, thank you. And I guess to uh, touch back on the conversation of Belleville, the shop, Mario, all of that, it's kind of amazing how all of that happened. I mean, you moved away and I believe started working at another shop, correct? Yeah, I, 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 I still work at a card shop. It's part time along with my journalism. I've worked there on and off for three years because the only time I didn't work was because I had to go to Belleville for school. I had to go like on and off in Belleville. But right. yes, but yeah, I work. I, I currently work at a card shop right now atop my journalism. Yeah, so you went off and you started to do that. Mario, I believe, actually started Mario's Gaming World two weeks before I decided to get back into Yu-Gi-Oh! Mm -hmm. And so it was actually just this really convenient thing that happened. I think the first time that I went there, there were only eight of us in the shop. And, you know, to me, that seems like very low numbers considering, you know, Action Pack was that 20 to 30, 35 uh, mm -hmm. consistent uh, number of people. But then you know, things started to grow and we got it to 10 people each week and then we got it to 12 people each week and then uh, different people started to hear about the channel and then we had people coming from Kingston regularly. Uh, Brandon lived in Kingston throughout the entirety of the time he was in the vlog, but he'd come down, Andrew, same thing. So I guess because of both Mario and my YouTube channel, we were able to start accumulating all of these different people within like two hours worth of a drive. And... <laughs> Right before uh, everything kind of got shut down, we were consistently around 15, 16. So not the biggest numbers, but 
we were able to pretty much double it in like four to five months. And that was a really, really fun thing to build with Mario as well. Which is an amazing growth to see in a shop because, um, first of all, uh, I know the Kingston meta, which is another hour east of Belleville. And it's a much bigger city, uh, over 100,000 people there. And I know many of the players there uh, said, you know, it was they didn't feel like it was worth their while to to come to Belleville or come to my my hometown of Peterborough to go play Yu-Gi-Oh. They refused to travel unless it was for for regionals and whatnot. And now all of a sudden you're telling me now that people are starting to come down from that area now to Mario's shop. And uh, we've seemingly seen big numbers of that, which is spectacular to see. I can't wait to get back to Belleville myself and play in a local whenever this epidemic kind of frees up and we're a- allowed to do so. So mm-hmm. I think that's really impressive to see that happen. And I kind of experienced that myself because – um, Peterborough opened up that the card shop that I work at right now they opened up three years ago and before that we had a shop that we'd get around eight to nine people our first tournament we generated about 17 people Ooh. and then eventually those numbers have started to grow and I think we hit a maximum once of uh, we hit a maximum of 34 people at one day and I was completely shocked and I think um, you know the spawn of a new shop or like something to spark the community is mm-hmm. really a great way to draw people in and I think your shop, uh, Mario shop, and your YouTube channel like really filled the numbers with that shop and kind of helped put uh, Yu Gi Oh to be really relevant again in Belleville. Because when I moved there, there was only about seven to eight people that would play, and then after I left, all of a sudden, you had like a ton of growth. And it's, I- I'm proud for Mario, I'm happy for him that he's getting all this business. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was great. And again, so much of it happened because of our YouTube channels, but then also really great, just organic moments. I was at the bank one day and I, I bumped into Wesley Switzer and it's like, oh, hey, haven't seen you in like 10 years. How you doing, buddy? We used to be really close. We used to play cards together. And I said, hey, you know, uh, Mario just opened up this shop. You want to uh, come play some Yu-Gi-Oh this Saturday? He said, sure. It was just another another person in one of those really cool organic situations where, you know, there's an old friend, there's a new member of the community and um, continuing to build something big and special together. And I think that's also another thing that helps build that community, too, because b- before if you see low numbers like seven or eight people, it kind of gets a little bit a uh, little bit stale because you're playing this. You know, you're going to play mm-hmm. the same people over and over again. You know, you're not going to get that variety. And, you know, if there's less people, that means there's less cards circulated around, less people to trade with, less people to interact with, less people to play with and whatnot. But if you get that, if you get that community, if you develop it, I feel like a lot of the older players who used to play get inspired to come back and play. And I've seen that in my mm-hmm. own meta as well. And I'm, I'm pr- and as you said, uh, I'm pretty certain that we're seeing that right now in Belleville too. Yeah, definitely. It's excitement. It's asking your friends every week, hey, are you going to this? Hey, I just, uh, I just did this in the tournament. It was pretty cool. I just tried out this new deck. Have you tried this? It's, you know, engaging. It gets that conversation started and those conversations spread. Yeah, because... When I started playing Yu-Gi-Oh, or even well, even before that, I should say, I, I was a fan of the show like you were, but I didn't want to get any of the Yu-Gi-Oh cards because I didn't know people that played. And it was like way back when Pokemon cards came out. Like I didn't want to collect them because I didn't know anybody that actually played the game properly. As you said, we made up our own little fake rules, and I didn't <laughs> like that. But when I found out of a group of friends that did play Yu-Gi-Oh! and that there were tournaments that I could play in, the very next day I bought myself a starter deck and got myself immersed in the game, and I haven't stopped since then. So I think that's definitely a, a big spark to the locals, is just being able to like just have people to play, because that's a really important thing, you know, because you can only do so much online before you kind of get it kind of gets dissatisfying. That's why we kind of crave being able to play with a lot of people in person because you also develop a lot of like personal connections with the two and like even long lasting friendships that are a part of it as well, which is, I think a lot of people are missing because you know that there are several Yu-Gi-Oh players that may, may, may be like socially awkward or like, they're just not like quite, uh, they're very introverted and like have trouble making friends or whatnot and being able to like finally interact and, you know, people accepting him in is a great way to kind of help them, you know, come out of their shell in other words. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, I, I think that this game can be incredibly healthy on so many levels, mental health wise, uh, getting people out of the house, getting people to interact and make friends and have those social experiences really practice talking to people, right? Because not everybody is inherently fantastic at that. So yeah, I think that, you know, 
it it does a whole lot of good. It really does. Yeah, because on the surface, Yu-Gi-Oh, to most people, it, it's a hobby. You know, it's it's yeah. a game that we like to play, and it's something that we like to enjoy. And it, but it requ- but it requires people. Well, for the most part, unless you play video games, it requires people to interact with, and that's the thing. It's a social game. It's something we like to do. We get to meet new friends, and I think that's one of the joys of Yu-Gi-Oh. It's just being going out there and meeting so many new friends. I mean, I met my current girlfriend right now through Yu-Gi-Oh. She doesn't play anymore now, but that's how I met her through it because I, I was working and sh- and she happened to play there with her her ex boyfriend at the time, and you know that that's how we started. Met we started clicking and that's how i have my best friend that's how i made one of my close friends where if i had decided not to make a connection with him i wouldn't have went to a shonen job championship in columbus ohio if i hadn't have done that so you know it's just making those mm-hmm. little friends here and there and you know we make a bunch of travel buddies you get to go to all these wonderful places you know i love to eat food i get to go to different places and eat food and whatnot so you know there's a whole lot of benefits of being able to play this game in person right now and especially during this pandemic it's really difficult to do that and i think that's what um, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think I can in this case that we're all waiting for this pandemic to be over so we can all get back to seeing everyone again in person, being able to play Yu-Gi-Oh! 100%. Yeah, I think there is very little as satisfying as being at a regionals and having someone come up, say, hey, I really like the channel, and then just having an opportunity to talk with them about their journey, what they're doing. That's um, That's a huge highlight, and I can't wait to get back to it. Yeah, because I feel like when you play online, there's not much of a like a human factor involved with it because you know everyone's kind of almost everyone's kind of hiding behind like a username that you may not know of and it's it's not as it's not as casual it's not as lax i find like you can and there's a lot of maybe like insults that might get rolled around it in <laughs> trash talking between players but you don't really do that a whole lot when you're playing in person you know you don't you're not a keyboard warrior at that point you know you get to have a a genuine connection with the person you're playing and i'm friends with maybe like 90, 95% of my own Yu-Gi-Oh community. And I, I'm pretty sure that's going to be roughly the same percentage for you with everyone you interact with at your local. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. For sure. Yeah. So I, 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 I've had a couple of people come into my house and we played some Yu-Gi-Oh before and everybody always keeps telling me that they, they're, they're so grateful that they are able to play a little bit of Yu-Gi-Oh again and that they can't wait to be able to like play like tournaments again in real life. And I, I hope that this, you know, this, when this pandemic is ready to be over, like I don't want it to be over prematurely, of course, cause I don't want to be, I don't want to go through another year without playing in real life. You know, mm-hmm. uh, everyone's going to be so relieved to be able to play and I, I can't wait for it. And I also can't wait to come back to Velvo and play with you guys at Mario's gaming world. Cause I've, I haven't yet to been to a shop ever since he like really vamped it up. Like he had like a very small, he rented out like a very small building at one point and mm-hmm. held it on for a couple of weeks until he had another tenant come in because his parents owned the building. But now that he has a, like a, a finalized place, like I really want to come to Belleville, see everybody again and play you guys, you know, maybe get another rubber match in with you because you and I haven't played in years either. I think that sounds like an absolutely fantastic opportunity. <laughs> maybe and- that's something we ought to record. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it'll end up in a video uh, from one of us, at least. I know yes. that you have a lot of old gameplay on your channel as well. Is that still up there or is it just podcast now? No, no, it, it's it's still up there. But, uh, you know, I, I don't touch that anymore. I used to YouTube myself, but uh, I fell out of it once uh, I started my professional wrestling career because I focused on that a little bit more. And uh, I, I didn't really have a lot of uh, chances to film at that point. I got just really busy and I just kind of fell out of it. And not to mention my video editing skills at the time were just pathetic and they're awful. I was using Windows Movie Maker, for God's sake. I wasn't using any professional program. So the videos just looked bad. They looked terrible. And even after going through journalism school, even though I was taught more video editing, it's not my greatest strength. So uh, I'm covering that uh, kind of up with this podcast, so I don't have to do a whole lot of video editing to really kind of make it sparkle and make it shine. I can just make the podcast, and that's really the the heart and soul of what my channel is supposed to be at this point in time. But uh I'm sure that you and I could get something together together eventually once uh, this all opens it up. I'd love to do some collaborations with you when it comes time. Yeah, I think that'd be so much fun. Definitely. <laughs> oh, man, I cannot wait for that, man. And I miss everybody from Belleville, man. But uh, I'm sure a lot of our viewers right now are wondering, like, where is this place? I don't know who <laughs> these people are or anything like that. But that's, but that's the thing, though. This is just an example of what our Yu-Gi-Oh! roots are. And I'm sure that everyone has their own little story to tell 
from their own roots, from like from the local that st- they started out with to the local that they're playing now. Everyone has that kind of story, and you know, it's and, and it's a it's a long journey, but it's a fun journey for sure. And I I'm I don't regret playing this game for a single minute of my life at all. This game has changed me, but it's changed me for the better, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah, I think um, if we just kind of look back on the last hour of the podcast here. I think it's definitely focused on the idea of community of, you know, having these long lasting friendships, really being able to capture those moments Mm -hmm. and, you know, just ensuring that while (laughs) it's a, it's a game and it's a competitive (laughs) game that I think at the end of the day, for a lot of us, the most important part is the connections. And Mm -hmm. I've actually, I've talked to so many pros and this actually, it always surprises me. But, you know, over the last nine or 10 months, I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of people. And I find that the most competitive players really put a big emphasis on just the conversations they get to have with people, the experiences, the travel, Mm -hmm. all of that. You'd assume when you talk to them that it would be about, you know, what deck is the best, what's, you know, the, the right type of play here and there. But so often I find that even they are more so focused on just enjoying the game. And being a good person with other people, which I think is also really interesting because I think a lot of pros have this um, uncalled for stigma in that they can be kind of standoffish or Mm -hmm. that all they care about is winning or that they're willing to cheat. All of these negative connotations. But I really have found that everybody I've talked to has very much really put a foot forward to be a good person in all interactions that they have and really try to go above and beyond in that respect uh, as well as the actual game. But yeah, I, I think that we're in a very unique, interesting situation in community where even the highest level of players are very down to earth and just genuinely good people. I find it really weird how that stigma is actually even placed upon, uh, you know, these these bigger Yu-Gi-Oh players, like you know, the celebrity Yu-Gi-Oh figures that are around. Because uh, you know, like we we hear a lot of horror stories about you know Hollywood with actors and actresses how they mm-hmm. just kind of like have like standoff moments with fans, but it it's not as bad as it is with uh, with Yu-Gi-Oh. Not because of the popularity, but because like you know we we keep our heads on the ground as well. And we, I think we're a little bit more down to earth possibly than uh, mm-hmm. other celebrities at least. But you know, I, I've talked to so many like top people right now. Like if I look down my own list of every single episode, uh, a podcast that I did, like these are all big name people that I'm talking to, in- including yourself, but you all agreed to be able to talk with me. And that's definitely a, a big deal right now. And I, I th- think that's a wonderful thing that the bigger players are doing right now is being able to share their, their knowledge and experience with everybody else mm-hmm. yeah definitely i mean things like uh duelist academy that mm-hmm. opened up where you know you have these opportunities to actually talk and chat with these well really the best players in the world on their discord or have actual private coaching sessions mm-hmm. cody angeloff i know that he has his own private coaching which he advertises over on his twitch channel there are all of these massive opportunities, which I just think are absolutely wild. I've seen it advertised a couple of times on Zodiac Duelists, uh, which is a very interesting place. Uh, sometimes fantastic, sometimes a little questionable. But uh, whenever I see those posts there, I see a lot of people who are really excited. And I see a little bit of pushback uh, onto the idea of coaching, but... I've done quite a bit of it uh, with Duelist Academy, and I, I have to say that like, I found that I became a much better player through it. Uh, the amount of information you can pick up quickly is incredible, and the fact that we actually, again, have these opportunities to talk with people who are kind of at the top of the metagame and the top mm-hmm. of the scene is really incredible. I know that that's something that kind of but doesn't really exist within the uh, painting sphere i mean i can talk to all of these different painters who have you know a million subscribers or under but i mean if you're talking about painters who are in gallery x or y across the world that you know sell their paintings for uh you know five million ten million that's not really something that i have access to but in Yu-Gi-Oh, you have access to the top of the top players. They are making themselves accessible. And I think that's something that's so neat about this space in particular. Yeah, the transparency right now from like the top players, the pro players, is 
Absolutely amazing. And I'm going to flex a little bit of my uh, philosophy uh, degree here. You know, back then, uh, way back in the old days, universities used to be just for, you know, people of high class or, or for the rich. So the knowledge that was spread around at that point would be uh, wouldn't be available to everybody. But mm-hmm. nowadays, but nowadays, like accessing Yu-Gi-Oh! knowledge is is easier than ever. We have so many programs, so many coaching programs, and so many people who are willing to be open about, about talking about strategies. Like we see so many YouTube channels now about people willing to show their deck list after after topping an mm-hmm. event, which is so wonderful that we're seeing people do now. So I think that you know, getting into Yu-Gi-Oh! and learning about the game has never been easier than it has been before now. And I had a very long conversation about this with with doug zeef when he was on my podcast and i think it's really fantastic how you know like we can you can be out for 10 years and all of a sudden you know in the span of maybe one year you know pick up the game again without skipping a beat yeah the turns can feel more complicated than they ever have but Mm -hmm. you have the information it is at your fingertips i mean back when we were playing you know again or say between goat and teledad format Mm -hmm. the internet wasn't really the thing it is today. We lived on dial-up, probably, and <laughs> deck lists, they just weren't released. The metagame theory wasn't there to the extent that it was. Maybe you pick up a Beckett magazine that has all this Yu-Gi-Oh! content and it has the last Shonen Jump winner uh, deck list, but that's <laughs> really all you get, and then you're kind of figuring it out from there, where mm-hmm. now you have 15 people talking about Luna Lights when they top uh, regionals in uh, you know February of 2020 and there's just so much information on this deck you just wouldn't have thought about before and that's incredible that, that's so so neat yeah the the evolution of technology has really helped with Yu-Gi-Oh nowadays because we have information you know at the virtually at the touch of, of a few buttons here and there where before like we would have to maybe bring our own laptops or you know ask the store to have to look it up on their computer and it might take a couple of minutes for it to do now but you know managing Yu-Gi-Oh learning more about it has never been easier and it, it's a wonderful thing really because uh, as I mentioned on Doug Z's podcast uh, Doug Z's episode you know a lot of us are getting older now and we're starting to have more like real responsibilities a lot of players I know like have kids have children they can't really spend as much time as they can on the game so being able to have this resource to keep yourself on top of the game is, is absolutely fantastic and that's why uh, we've seen so many players have just long extended like fantastic Yu-Gi-Oh careers because even with those other responsibilities they can still keep on top of things uh, and you know not have to make Yu-Gi-Oh as much of a commitment as they used to back in the day right yeah you don't have to spend hours and hours and hours working on combos that just don't end up working you have those combos and then you can kind of tweak and you know work with them make them the way that you want it takes you know nine out of ten of those steps out of there Obviously, a lot of that skill still comes out in the actual play and being able to adapt to different hand traps or whatever your opponent may be playing. But I think it definitely lessens the initial time investment, which is great, as again, as you mentioned, so many of us getting older. And I'm not really, I'm not sure that this game is as accessible to a younger community in the game that it once was. We're not going normal summon set to pass. It's significantly more complicated. And I think with that comes a lot older of a player base and therefore more so the need for easily accessible information and a lot of it. Mm-hmm. And definitely that too, because the game is also like, evolved in itself too. It's it, as you said, it's not just set one, set two, pass. You know, it's building a big board and you know, seeing seeing if you can like break it as well. Like, as we're seeing, games are being done within like easily the first three to five turns, if not the first turn as well. So, yeah, it, it's definitely something you have to adapt to as well. And that's why we have a lot of people that you know say like goat format is you know like the good old days as opposed to <laughs> what it is now. It, it was a lot harder to win back then than what it is now because some people can just just get away with memorizing a combo and just and winning off of it yeah i i strongly feel that the Yu-Gi-Oh of old and the Yu-Gi-Oh of now are two very different games yeah. and i almost don't feel like they're comparable i don't feel like saying goat is the good old days really makes all that much sense because i do feel that 
you were playing a different game at that point. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of us need to accept that. And I know that I've personally uh, been buying some Max Rarity goats, uh, mm -hmm. putting that deck together just for the nostalgia oh, play of the, of the guys. Um, so I'm going to be playing older Yu-Gi-Oh! I'm going to be playing Yu -Gi newer Yu-Gi-Oh! I'm going to have a lot of fun with all of it. But I do think that there is still a lot of skill in it. I know that turns, <laughs> you might only get two of them in a game of modern <laughs> yeah. Yu-Gi-Oh! But I don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing because within a turn, you're getting probably 40 to 50 interactions of some kind. Um, maybe three of them are from your opponent in the form of hand traps or interruptions. But you're doing as many things in a game as you were doing back in Yu-Gi-Oh! of old, except you're doing all of them in a singular turn. And there's still a lot of skill. I mean, I've been playing uh, Dragon Link for the last little while. And, you know, you build your board of, like, five different negates. You have your scythe. Your opponent can't special summon the deck. You're doing all these different things. But then they draw a Dark Ruler no more. And it's, okay, well, that didn't work. <laughs> yep. they're, uh, they're going to break that with a uh, Dinosaur Deck X, right? And then it's like, okay, well, how do we how do we get a little better? Well, we can incorporate Smoke Grenade, and we can pop that off a Tracer, and then, you know, maybe we can rip that Dark Ruler out of their hand before they get a chance to use it. It's incorporating a Brick, so now do we change the number of cards in our deck? Do we kind of alter those ratios? And then, oh, you know, maybe we just play Infernoble Noble Knights, rip a couple cards, and, you know, because, well, what if they do have the Dark Ruler no more and the Droplets, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that there's still a lot of skill to be had in the game, even if, it occurs within two turns. I just think that it's a different game. <laughs> and that's a really good point that you made because even though the, the turns are, are more congested nowadays, but it, that doesn't mean that, you know, there's a lack of interactions in between because, yeah, as you said, you know, we're, we're seeing about like, if we were to log every single move that would happen, we're probably logging off about like 30 to 40 different moves that are happening in one turn. And then it's up to the skill on the other side of the player to, to, to figure out when is the right time to, to interrupt and when to play what hand trap to interrupt your opponent to be able to, to fire off. Sometimes it's a gamble. Sometimes it's a calculated risk. Sometimes you just know. And, you know, that's also, and that's a new skill. I think that's kind of, uh, evolved into Yu-Gi-Oh nowadays because before like we didn't really have ha a lot of hand traps if mm -hmm. at all any back in the day and now we have some so like right off the get-go even when it's not your turn like in the first turn you still have to make some interactions to make sure that you're in the best possible position for when it actually comes time for your turn yeah exactly and and knowing when to time those hand traps right i mean if your opponent is doing 30 things in a turn and you have say an imperm maybe an ash maybe an ibiru you can't just hit the first card that comes out. You have to figure out where those proper choke points are in the combo. You have mm -hmm. to consider how many extenders they have. If they have that extender, well, then maybe you wait for that to occur. A uh, mm -hmm. great example, last week I was playing against uh, Ganon. He was playing Megalith with Block Dragon and uh, the King of uh, the Calamities card. That says yep. your opponent just can't play it all. They can't respond to it, uh, mm -hmm. the Synchro. And I was going off, I, I won the dice roll, and I'm uh, doing the Inferno Noble Knight combo. I get the gear freed out before I go into the Assault and all of that, so I'm feeling really safe. But then when I go for the Halk, he activates the Nibiru in hand, and I'm like, why does he do that? I have the, the gear freed, okay, I'll negate, but he also has the Imperm. So he oh. uses both of them on that. He stops the combo. But if he tried to use each of them individually, it wouldn't really have done much if he just kind of shotgun them wouldn't have made a difference but it's recognizing how to time and sometimes how to work your hand traps in conjunction with one another to make those skillful plays that win you or lose you the game and i think that in itself was just a, a great example of that timing and that skill yeah and i believe that you know not everyone is going to put all their cards on the table on the first turn either because if it gets mm -hmm. broken you're not going to have much of a backup when it comes to your turn again, if you somehow are able to survive that as well. And that's also a skill in itself as being able to know when you can show some restraint in doing your combo and thinking, it, should I, should I put this out there and how's it going to benefit me? Is it going to work against them? And, you know, asking those questions again is also something that you have to learn and develop and make yourself a better player as well. You know, you still can't just put everything on the table and hope that everything's going to be okay. 
Oh, without a doubt. I mean, um, <laughs> again, I think a lot of people know me and the channel from Heroes. And I think when a lot of people start playing Heroes, they play these cards called A Dusted Gold and Malicious Bane. They kind of have their own side arc on the channel. But in so many scenarios, I see newer players with them. They search the Dark Calling turn one. They're going first. They set up the the Dark Law, the Zero. They have their mass changes. Maybe they have a Plasma, et cetera, et cetera. And then for whatever reason, it's the Dark Calling and they summon the Bane turn one. And it's mm -hmm. like, that's not going to do anything for you it's just a body on board it's not a disruption it's something you could have held so if they broke your board you can come back in the next turn same thing with uh miracle fusion different scenarios like that and i mean we all make those mistakes don't get me wrong i'm not, I'm yeah, not calling of course anybody. you watch my first time playing heroes i think uh when do i made cross crusader pass so yeah. i'm not trying to say um you know anybody's necessarily bad at the deck but recognizing when to hold back and when to unload your hand is absolutely huge, which it used to be as well in Go format, right? I mean, you're not going to set four in a format where your opponent can just heavy storm you and, you know, yes. win off our advantage right there. Yeah, I, I, absolutely that. And uh, I know that there was somebody who used to go to Belvo Locals. I'm not going to say their name out loud, but I'm going to message you on Messenger right now, this person. And <laughs> yeah. every time I played against this person, their whole entire strategy was to just pack their entire deck with nothing but floodgates and put everything on the board and hope that their opponents couldn't break it. But every time that person <laughs> did it to me, I always broke their board. Yeah. And then they would, and then they would, they would scoop. Like they, at the sign of the first crack in their wall, it's, they, they would scoop. And, you know, I'm like, thinking, that's not the greatest way to develop your skill. It's just kind of throw hail Mary every turn. And, and that's why I thought this person could never beat me because that was a strategy, but I was always like prepared and planned and ready to go. Or I was able to like slowly grind my way through and be and beat that person and like, you know, beat those. And I think that's also like a major skill in itself is being able to break boards. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people talk about the dice roll determining who wins or who loses in 2019, <laughs> 2020 Yu-Gi-Oh! And it's really that <laughs> simple. You know, you roll the dice, everybody scoops it up, you pack up your deck and you, uh, you're a winner. But yeah. I, I do think that if a player is properly timing their hand traps, if they're, you know, aware of what they need to hit, how to prioritize their cards, how to work through those negates, you can win some games that just you wouldn't imagine, right? Yeah. And I'm sure we all have those major underdog stories or stories that we've been put in like really difficult situations and we've somehow been able to pull a rabbit out of the hat and and successfully win. I mean, I know I've had that story. I'm pretty sure you've had a story like that as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's one of the really wonderful things about Yu-Gi-Oh! It's, again, just all of these really special, funny little moments where the most random thing happens like that or the most skill-testing thing like that happens. Your opponent builds full out Emancipator board. You, you <laughs> stare down, you know, four different negates and some form of floodgate, and it's all right, all right. Well, let's get to it. You know, five <laughs> minutes later, you get through it. I didn't. I didn't think that would happen, but you know, here we are. So, yeah, I, I definitely think that it adds a, a really different but great element of fun, and I, I think that it also speaks to the fact that despite the fact that power creep is inevitable and it only gets stronger every year, that in three to five years the game will be very different but it'll still be fun in a different way and it might be a a whole new game again we talk about goat format being one game about 2020 Yu-Gi-Oh being another game maybe 2025 will be an entirely new game maybe it'll be like the kind of third version obviously we're not actually breaking it up but maybe it'll be played in a different way and that's interesting i think there's a reason why Yu-Gi-Oh still exists you know 20 years in where other card games fail and adapting and keeping it fresh is probably pretty huge whether yeah, we recognize it or not and keeping it fresh in this game is, is definitely a big deal considering we have very few alternate formats uh, in, in Yu-Gi-Oh! you have traditionally advanced you might have like you have like the battle pack duels back in the day you mm -hmm. had uh, you have, we have duel links now or sp aka speed duels we have those but you know we we don't see a lot of popularity as what we send formats that you'd see in like magic, the gathering, for example, they have a ton of different formats and almost extensively, almost everybody at least plays like commander format for one thing, but you get, we we're very limited in our format. So keeping the game fresh, I think is one way that, you know, people are still like drawn and still want to stay pace with the game because, you know, I've played through 
Lord knows how many formats. And, it, <laughs> and but but yet you know I still keep in the game and I love it. And of course I would say there are there are definitely formats that have been worse than a lot of others and a lot of formats where I really detest and I wish never existed. But uh, mm-hmm. with, with that being said, you know, like the game needs to evolve in order to stay fresh and keep people in and even draw new people in as well. And uh, I'm glad that Yu-Gi-Oh! has been able to like retain the popularity that it's had, if not have it more accessible and more popular than what it was before. Because, uh, you know, as I mentioned, like the regional that I won, the, you know, that was nine rounds for the very first time. It's been consistently that way. And that was in 2012 in December. And that's and it's been that way for like eight years now. We're seeing nine round regionals, which is it's nice, but at the same time, it's like, oh man, I have to go through nine rounds to top a regional. Good lord. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing. Oh, you say that, but I, I get so excited at the nine round regionals. Whenever um, you know, coming back to the game, going to Toronto, it would be nine rounds, it'd be nine rounds. And I, I love that. I love just sitting down and doing something for like twelve hours straight. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we went to one in Montreal where I think it was eight rounds, and I was like, "Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna miss that night." Yep. Really good about that. <laughs> it's just it's, so much fun. Yeah, it's definitely fun though, because Montreal again used to be perennially seven rounds, and then once they grew, and then once they got the numbers, they got to go to eight rounds as well. So it's just nice to see like anywhere you go. Uh, you're seeing like the meta grow. And that was the same with Ottawa too. Yeah. Ottawa used to be like six rounds for a while. Then it grew to seven and now it's eight rounds. So that's like, that's a great thing to see that we're getting more people because for me, that's more competition. That's more games that I get to play with other people. And it's also more people that I get to interact with and trade with. So, you know, it, yeah. it fits all of my standpoints. The only, the only bad thing, and I'm using air quotes when I say this, is that it's just a tougher road to make top eight. But then again, it's also right. much, you feel much more accomplished when you make that top eight. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I, I want to bring this now. Like, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go no, no, I, no. You go for it. Your oh, podcast. Because I'm, I'm going to like a different complete subject. So if you want to touch up on touch on it now. Okay. This is slightly a different subject, but it's also an aside to kind of the longevity of the game, where the game's going, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, go I, ahead. It's come out, and I'm asking you because you're obviously quite knowledgeable. You part time work in a shop. I think that you're a good person to ask. I'm really curious as to see where you think the game is in five years considering the fakes that are being introduced into the game i think we hear a lot now about fake dds cards and the fact that they're getting so similar right now i think that the notable differences are the little gold stamp in the bottom right corner the back is a little bit more filmy but five years from now and i i mentioned this because again I, I have a background in art a little bit in art forgery things like that so i know just how quickly this advances and i am sure five years from now we're going to have pretty much perfect fakes what happens to the physical card game in that state when things like that can be mass and professionally produced do you think that the game moves to something like dual links do you think konami continues doing what they're doing do you think they have a hard reset card wise where perhaps they start using materials that are less easily, you know, creatable. And what does it do to the market? Because I feel like these are all really big things. And it's a conversation that not too many people are having, but I feel like you probably have an interesting perspective. You know, it's a, it's a funny thing that you mentioned this, because I hadn't thought of this whole lot. But now that you're bringing it up, I can definitely see a lot of factors why uh, Konami would not want to like move into like a more like kind of like a digitized state because first of all even though konami doesn't really aren't isn't really involved with it per se but like the secondary market is a huge thing for Yu Gi Oh. like you got a lot of people that kind of make a living off the secondary market and we're not just talking like just like your your average tools to one we're talking about stores that you know make a living off you know selling singles because that's a big thing too because my store sells singles for example and the other Yu Gi Oh store in peter road doesn't sell singles so that's like a big upside that we have and not to mention you know a part of the game as well in Yu-Gi-Oh is being able to like you know get new cards and trade with people as well which is also another big interaction so if you kind of move it away digitally you kind of take away a, a lot of that power of mm-hmm. being able to like give cards trade cards and the, you know Yu-Gi-Oh is meant to be like a, a very social interaction game so I don't see Konami going in that direction now I can understand maybe stepping in the other direction a little bit more to kind of help that out. But I can't see them phasing out uh, the, the physical part of the game ever, even with uh, counterfeits or whatnot. Because, I mean, they've been pretty good with it so far. And I know that, like, Upper Deck kind of had that trouble with Konami way back when, and then they got slammed for it, lost all <laughs> rights to print the cards so whatnot. So they're pretty strict on that, Konami, uh, on that regard. And I hope, 
hope it doesn't turn to that way because honestly, the, being a, a physical part of the game is a big reason why I play it because I love the social interaction that goes with it as well. I barely play online. Yeah. Uh, I might if I have to, but honestly, I would rather play like in person because I believe that's how the game is really meant to how to be how it should be played. Uh, that's what I love. I love the, the psychological aspect. I love the social aspect. I love being able to like, you know, pick up my cards physically and just kind of play around with them or not. And it's like, it's kind of like a, it's a physical representation of like, kind of like your, your art, your work, and you know, like your blood, sweat and tears goes into the deck. You built this deck. Uh, these are the cards that you like worked hard to, to get, or in some cases borrow, but n- nonetheless, you know, like that's, that's the rewarding part. Like going on a dueling book and just throwing on a deck, it's, it's not as rewarding because, you know, you, you can't really record the time and effort that you really put into that per se, as much as a physical deck. Right. Yeah, for sure. I, I definitely think that playing IRL is significantly more fun. I guess I was just more curious if you saw that persisting in a world where fates were everywhere. And I'm I'm very happy to hear that you feel like that lives simply for the social aspect. Yeah, because the social aspect is a, is a major part of me. And I'm also a, a giant extrovert as well. So I like going out there yeah. <laughs> and interacting with people, like talking with people. I'm also... Uh, I also don't mind talking to people on the phone. I know I have a lot of friends that like will never answer my phone calls and they say, just text me instead. <laughs> I'm like, no, but I like to talk. I'm like, I'm also a journalist as well. Like I have to do phone calls. A bunch of, yeah. I can't just fully do 100% do like text interviews all the time. So I kind of use phone calls as a way to, you know, kind of keep myself in training and keep myself in the habit of it. So it's just that little thing I like to do as well. And if you notice, if you ever message me or text me, I try to type in like near perfect grammar and spelling as well, because again, that's part of my profession that, you know, no one really wants to, you know, trust a journalist that, you know, can't even <laughs> properly spell or, or, or grammar their words properly, even though, even though it's not a real phrase, you don't say that, but you, you get what I mean. Like, you know, the professional aspect. Of yeah. It. This, uh, this guy wants to talk to me, but he, uh, he doesn't seem to understand what commas are, which is a little <laughs> concerning. <laughs> I love those comma jokes that I see like, like all the time. Like, you know, with the, the, uh, the uncle Jack and the horse joke that, that I, mm. I always find that pretty funny as well. So, and uh, every time I see, uh, uh, um, like a grammar joke or a grammar meme, uh, I have a, a grammar professor at Loyalist college, uh, where I once studied my journalism school and I would mm. send it to her from time to time. We'd get a laugh out of it. And I, I enjoy doing those things. And I actually bought Grammarly. I bought oh. the program and I bought Microsoft Word, like Word Office. I have it all, like it's all like actually purchased and bought. Yeah, to part, as part of my because my because the student uh, the, st- the student free version ran out on me because I'm no longer a student. So buying my <laughs> is a bit of a flex. Yeah, I appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> you don't hear a lot of people say that they buy Microsoft Word, but I'm one of them. No, I respect that. I feel like a lot of people just randomly find microsoft word on the internet and then it's on their computer who really knows how it happens maybe it's a virus maybe it downloaded itself who knows uh but yeah <laughs> for actually supporting the product and purchasing. yeah exactly that and when i made my first intro video I, I mentioned that um the music that's in my intro uh the graphics that were made and and my logo art like they're all made from like my friends who are who, like specialize in those in those areas of expertise like i have a friend who's a musician made the music i have a friend who's a graphic designer made the graphics my girlfriend is an artist she drew my she drew my logo and i legitimately paid her money for it too (laughs) i i paid out of my own pocket for it so you know i wasn't doing favors like i i paid them for their work like i will happily support a friend and invest in their product if they're peddling something you know so you know i'm not going to ask for freebies for them good for you yeah, yeah, that's, so that, that, that's, that's a huge thing in the art world, and I know a lot of people would really appreciate you for it. Yeah, it, it, it definitely is. And, you know, just kind of hearing those struggles because, you know, and, and think of a world without art. Like, you know, yeah. just sit in a blank room all day and you don't see all this, like, kind of, like, beautiful visuals coming around you. Like, you know, you kind of feel, like, a little bored or depressed or something like that. Nothing positive, really, like, with an empty room with nothing. So, like, art is definitely a big thing, and I'm I'm glad to support the, you know, that end of the spectrum, too. And also, even though philosophy, I wouldn't call it art, but it's Bachelor of Arts, too. So, yeah, uh, it's in that kind of spectrum. So, I can, you know, I can kind of empathize with that a little bit as well, because, you know, philosophy degree on its own might be a little bit useless, but thankfully I paired that up with uh, journalism, so it doesn't feel as useless. <laughs> I feel like we're very much in a similar camp in that uh, <laughs> polymaths appreciating 
a myriad of different things, but finding ways of kind of congealing them into something that somehow renders a living and uh, a good way of, you know, enjoying them. Yeah, which is uh, absolutely important. So anyone out there, please solo- support your local artists. It's it's a big deal, and they, you know you know appreciate what they do because without art, it's uh, it, it's a tough world out there. Honestly, it's 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 a nice little escape, and it's a nice way to kind of appreciate like you know what we have in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Kraut's art is a, a great artist in the Yu Gi Oh space. It does all of these tunified uh, tokens or field centers, play mats, things like that. He's a great person to look up. Um, Amanda LaPalm has, you know, again, great tokens, mats, dice, all of that. A lot of great artists in the Yu-Gi-Oh community that you can support and get some really cool things from. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I went to one of my friends who's, who's another artist, and she designed my, my play mat. No, oh. so, Which I also use as well. So my, my current play mat that I've had, my legacy play mat, they're, they've been all been created by an actual artist i wanted to pay her she refused so, I'm like, oh. <laughs> so i can't like i can't just like stuff money into her pocket and, and run away like she refused i'm like done yeah. but I, I tried to pay her but she but she wouldn't take it so but that was really nice of her but then again that's that's just me like i like and i also me investing into this podcast maybe like commit to it it's like all right i'm all in with this i spent like 400 bucks into this may as well actually get it running it's a good motivator to keep me going yeah exactly yeah (laughs) so let's bring this now full circle you you've made your series your return to Yu-Gi-Oh you finally made the announcement in August that you're now officially back in the game so what's the next steps for Ryan O'Rourke aka Ruggles there are a couple of them I've been doing light tests of different series, different ideas that I have, some filming here and there, throwing together mock-ups. I, I think I'm a very calculated person. I, yes. I like to go into all of my endeavors feeling confident, having a plan, and you know, being ready to execute. And that requires time and it requires testing. So that's really what I've been doing over the last really two months because the last episode was filmed a month prior to its upload and (laughs) i just i want to make sure that the next step is correct so i have two different ideas that i think are going to come to fruition and they're series that i think will be a lot of fun they're going to be quite community based i while i while i've been creating my channel i realized that what really resonated to me was the community aspects, the ability to talk to friends, make those connections, have those nostalgic interactions. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I really want to focus the channel on. Mm-hmm. I thought about turning it into something a bit more competitive because I've been picking up more competitive decks and that's kind of what I've been enjoying playing over mm-hmm. the last five or so months, uh, mm-hmm. I guess, since the the series ended. Um, but, you know, I I think that putting a focus on people is something I want to do. As we Mm -hmm. talked about, I'm going to try a couple of different formats, one of which very high production, the other one more comical. And then I'm also going to do a a bit of a collaborative series, which will be quite interesting as well. But I did find that uploading the Yu-Gi-Oh videos and the painting videos each week Mm -hmm. was just unrealistic, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I found myself working honestly, a hundred, sometimes more hours a week on it. And Mm -hmm. while that's very fulfilling and that's how I want to live, I I do want a little bit more leeway. So I'm uh, in the process of hiring an assistant who will Mm -hmm. edit my videos with me and Mm -hmm. help me ensure that, you know, we can do all of this on a very regular schedule because going Mm -hmm. forward, I do want to kind of practice what I preach, make Mm -hmm. things more consistent. But I do believe that consistency really is the key to growth and kind of success in in online platforms specifically youtube just because of how the algorithm works Mm -hmm. so the next step is going to occur i think Mm -hmm. a month month and a half it's going to be two different series and it will be very community focused 
I'm glad you gave me a bit of a sneak peek on that because your last video on your YouTube channel was saying that you've returned to Yu-Gi-Oh! And we haven't seen a video since, even though that was a month ago. So I was really curious what was next for you. So I'm glad you kind of revealed just a little bit of it. But I don't want, to just, I don't want you to tell me too much because I'm a little excited to see what you've got uh, planned in store for us now that you're officially back in the game now as you've as you said last month so or yeah last month so i'm i'm really glad to see you back definitely for sure and uh you know i'm kind of hoping i can see you a bit more on the competitive side of things so uh, do you have any competitive goals in this game now that you're back i think that i I, i've always wanted to move on the route of uh topping the locals then winning a locals then getting an invite then topping a regionals then eventually someday topping a YCS. I think that's a goal pretty much everybody has, whether they want to admit it or not. Mm-hmm. But those are definitely still goals that exist. I think that <sighs> Yu-Gi-Oh! on a competitive level will always be something that's very much on the back burner of my priorities. Mm-hmm. I really love this game. I love playing uh, competitive decks. I love trying to win. I'm a very competitive person for sure. Mm-hmm. But... I also think that I value a lot of other things in life more so than I do winning at Yu-Gi-Oh. So it's something that I'm going to work towards over time, enjoy, but it's also, I don't really think ever going to be at the forefront of my ambitions. And I'm quite happy with that as a, you know, a 27 year old guy who is building a couple businesses and uh, (laughs) just trying to do the best at life in general that he can. So yes, I am. Uh, I am going to try to uh, top that regionals, and we'll uh, we'll go from there. Maybe. Well, no. I, I say maybe. We're definitely going to film regional vlogs when they're back. I want to capture those moments. I want to have those interactions with my friends saved. I want to remember all of it as clearly as I can, and I want to bring everybody along for the journey. So there will be more of a semi-competitive series on the channel on and off when mm-hmm. regionals returns. But until then, I think things are going to be more on the casual and more on the friendly side. So it's safe to say then that it, it's basically just a continuation of your series now that you're finally back into the game. Now we're just going to see your quest now that you're fully back and immersed into the game. Yeah, you'll, you'll see me actually know, you know how to link summon and climb properly. <laughs> uh, you, you'll see uh, decks that aren't necessarily in the rogue category. I think a lot of people actually in the Return to Yu-Gi-Oh! series got a little turned off when I started to play Eldritch in the end there because they had such an affinity and really such a history through the channel with the hero deck. And that's something that I really wanted to end the series with. I wanted to end on heroes. That's what we started with. That's what I wanted to end with. And I wanted to show that we'd come a long way, that we were playing pretty much perfectly, that we uh, had things down despite the fact that it was non-linear and that we could still bounce back and forth between more competitive builds. So going forward, while I'm sure I'm sure we'll have some videos of heroes, it'll probably be whatever the tier one deck is at that point. Well, it took 10 long months in order for you to like hype and announce your own return, but you're finally here, you're finally back, and you have a huge following uh, on top of that, and, and it really shows, you know, that people are really vouching for you, really hoping that you would get back into it. And uh, I'm one of those people who are because, again, you're a good friend of mine. We do have a history together, uh, a positive history, may I add. Without and, a- uh, yeah, and, and I'm glad to see you back, and I'm glad to see you so successful as well. And I'm really glad that we're, you know, finally able to have, like, a good long-standing conversation about it ever since you made your return. And, you know, I look forward to seeing – what you're going to produce in the future, man. And when this whole pandemic is over, my butt is driving to Belleville (laughs) and we're going to hang out and we're going to play some Yu-Gi-Oh together. I can guarantee you that once that happens. Well, hey, we we have to drive up there. We have to see you too as well. That's something that I know we really wanted to do, but time just didn't permit it. And, you know, when everything does clear up, we will have to make that happen. But really thank you for having me on. I love listening to these. It was a pleasure to be on really felt like catching up with an old friend because that's what it was. And that's what I'm sure so many of these conversations are for you. So thank you for producing a high quality Yu-Gi-Oh! podcast for us. That's something that really hasn't existed in this space uh, for really as long as you've been doing it. I, I know you don't have too many episodes out yet, but 
it doesn't seem like any other podcast has been able to really last this length. And it's really incredible the people that you get on, the conversations that you have, both about the game from a competitive standpoint, but also just getting to know incredible players, their stories, what they're into. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure, and you're a great person to deliver it in the medium that you do. Well, I really appreciate those kind words, man, because you know that like, I appreciate your work. I know you appreciate mine. We, you know, we're both, uh, you know, we're both starting. We both started from the ground up. You're a little bit farther than me now, of course. I'm still trying to get myself out there. But it, again, like drawing back to those parallels, you know, you went to school for film. I went to school for journalism. And, and these are the skills that we want to apply and bring to the table. I mean, that's what I toot every single intro I make, you know, I tell it, you know, this is the only podcast is done by an, an actual full fledged journalist, like a real journalist is doing this. And mm -hmm. we're, we're looking at somebody like you who is, who studied film school, who knows about video production, who knows about, you know, knows what B roll is, who knows like, you know, what, what visually captures the eye when to voice over, when to speak in person, like, you know how to do all that. And I think that really adds a, uh, a lot more legitimacy into the game, knowing that we have like actual qualified professionals to be able to, uh, you know, you know, get into this game and we can actually see it from that kind of level. It's something we've never really seen before. And now that, you know, we're a little bit older, we can kind of see this and it, it's great to see that the game kind of evolve now that we can now apply our, like our professional skills into this game. And uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I started this and hopefully I can get big too. But then again, I've been putting on an episode every week, so I'm unhappy with the consistency of it. So hopefully if, uh, if I get a little bit more bigger and, you know, I can per give myself a little bit more time, I'll try to, you know, release more than just one podcast a week. But uh, again, man i'm glad that i was able to get you on man and we were have uh, able to have like a great long conversation about it plus we got to catch up too with just you and me together as well because you, you disappeared from belleville for a bit doing your life and then i came in while you were gone and then after i left you came back so you know we kind of miss each other a little bit uh you know physically but you know emotionally no we haven't missed each other like that you know we've always been pretty tight together and it was uh glad to bring you on man and uh, i'm very happy to see the success that you've had so far on your channel and i'm happy that you're back in the game i'm really happy that we get to have these conversations again that we do get to see each other at events and that yep. you're doing what you are because you're doing a great job really Absolutely. thank you for having me on appreciate you being on and accepting this i know we had some scheduling problems before because i had a technical difficulty with internet before that's a really long story because uh, I share an internet with upstairs and uh, th there was a little bit of commotion up there, some like drama up there that happened that caused the internet to shut up. Like, oh, not this day. I'm like, not this day. Please don't. But thankfully I got it back and we were able to do this. And what a great conversation this has been. That is Ryan O'Rourke, a.k.a. Ruggles. He's got over 25,000 subscribers. Please subscribe to him if you haven't. All the links to his channels will be down below. Ryan, thank you so much for coming on to the Gate Expectations podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Don't forget to like and subscribe. For more information, check out the Gate Expectations podcast on YouTube, Facebook, Patreon, Twitter, and Spotify.